time to get into a foot washing attitude because exactly two weeks from last night, one week from last night, for those who hear this a week later, is the Lord's Supper. And we'll be meeting together again and going through a very strange, very unusual ceremony, if you can call it that. If you will turn to Luke, the 22nd chapter, beginning to read in verse 24, you will see one more example of what I've talked about for many, many decades on radio and television, that people look into the Word of God and they see where Jesus Christ says, This do as I have done unto you. Or don't believe this. Think not that I've come to destroy the law. So they think He came to destroy the law. <coughs> this do as I have done unto you. No, we won't do it. And so almost no churches except a very few of the Sabbatarian organizations that I know about observe exactly what Jesus Christ did. It says there was a strife among them. Imagine that, a strife among disciples of Christ. What a surprise. There were arguments. There were heated discussions here. And it was the Lord's Supper. And Jesus Christ was very heavy with what He knew was approaching Him. And the disciples could think of nothing else but arguing about which one had the inroad, which one was really going to be His right-hand man. Who was going to be number two in the work? I've heard some accusations coming from completely different quarters of the country in the last couple of three weeks of people saying, well, he thinks he's going to be number two in the work. I didn't know there was a number one. <laughs> I sure don't know of a number two or a three or a four. I'd be happy to be number 997 as long as I'm in the work. I thought Christ was number one, and I'm certainly not number two or anywhere near that. I think Christ is number one and all the rest of us are equals down there, 6,947 somewhere, aren't we? But these attitudes crop up and people think, oh, I think he's lobbying to be number two. Well, these disciples were doing it. They were trying to vie for being his right-hand man. Who gets to be Secretary of State? Who gets to be, you know, the uh, Attorney General or whatever of the new government that he was going to set up? He said unto them, verse 25, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. That's a contradiction in terms, isn't it? That's interesting. That's sort of the liberal philosophy of government today. They take away all your money and you nearly break down in tears if they begrudgingly, after a fight in Congress that takes months, decide to give a little bit of it back to you when it was your money in the first place. And so we call people who rule in government benefactors, people who give us great gifts. In fact, they are taking it away from us, but we have been hoodwinked into believing it's the other way around. You shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. If in the very first place the word minister had never been used in the church, and the word servant had been used entirely instead, it would have avoided a lot of misunderstanding, and a lot of problems, a lot of ethical violations, a lot of ego. Whether is greater, he that sits at meat, which obviously would be the Lord and the master of the house, or he that serves, the waiter that is waiting on the tables. Is it not he that sits at meat? But I am among you as he that serveth. You are they which have continued with me in my temptations. And I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father is appointed unto me, that you may eat and drink at my table in the kingdom, and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now notice in John 13, 3 through 10, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into His hands, and that He was come from God and went to God. Think about that statement. Knowing that the Father had given all things. What does that mean? All things. Everything. All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth, he said when he came back. And that he was come from God. So it shows he had vivid knowledge of his prehistory, his pre-human history with divine Elohim. He said, before Abraham was, I am. He said, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Knowing that he was come from God and went to God, he knows I'm going to return to heaven. I'm going to leave this earth and go back to the Father in heaven. He did this. He riseth from supper, laid aside his garments, and took a towel and girded himself. After that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with a the towel wherewith he was girded. That had to have 
provoked a lot of conversation. They must have been astonished because they were familiar with the process of having your feet washed when you came in to sit down to a dinner. That was common in the Middle East because you would have like a foyer and the meanest household servants, the one that stooped to the meanest kind of task work, would be those who would come and wash a wayfarer's or sojourner's or visitor's feet when they entered into the house from the dusty streets and muddy roads. And that was probably the most disagreeable chore that could be laid upon any servant. The question is this, what did Jesus Christ have to lose in doing this? What did it cost him? He had it all, it says right here. He knew that he had all things. The Father had given him all things. He was come from God and he went to God. This was not voluntary humility in the sense that he was trying to earn points. He was not trying to earn points. He wasn't trying to pretend to be humble so that his disciples would say, oh, isn't he humble? Because he had nothing to lose. He already had it all. He wasn't giving up anything. He was doing something that he wanted to do very badly to set them an example. But this was not posturing. You can make a mistake and think that it was posturing. It wasn't at all. It was real, genuine, because it didn't cost him anything. He wasn't giving up anything. He was doing it out of the absolute love and goodness of his heart to set them an example. He wasn't humiliated. He only wanted from them their love and faithfulness, and he was not making points, and he was not pretending. So here he is kneeling down there, and there are 12 of them, including Jewish, Judas Iscariot, who later on left and was not there for the bread and the wine, but he was there for the foot washing. Now, in those days, of course, they wore different kinds of foot gear than we do today. You're familiar with the warachi kind of thing or the, the sandals that they wore. And I'm not convinced that all of them were open-toed. I think that they had foot gear where they could have their feet enclosed by the skins of animals, just like we do today, but made differently. But nevertheless, there was commonly in the summer months especially, the wearing of open warachis or sandals and, and a different kind of footgear than we use today. Although you can still go buy them. If you go down to Mexico, they'll sell you that kind of thing. And you can buy them in some stores. So I think about all 12 of them. And I think about me sitting there with my old gnarled broken toes and my ugly feet. I wondered, were they, were they thick? Were they fat? Were they splayed? Were they hairy? Were they calloused? Were, did they have an ingrown toenail? Were they really ugly? Had some of them been wounded or injured? I mean, you're holding this old foot in your hand, right? And here is just a foot. And that's the ugliest part of a human body to me, except for my wife who's got the prettiest feet in the world. But <laughs> most human beings have a lot of human beings have ugly feet. Uh, I've seen some of these women sashaying down, you know, modeling clothing, and it so helped me if they had, if so much of them weren't turned under, they'd be, you know, six, eight. Uh, the, the, some of them have feet almost as long as the entire foot, the, the, the leg from the knee to the heel. It's unbelievable. So when you see uh, men or women with size 12 triple A, you know, that is not pretty. I mean, you might have a different idea, but to me, I, I am a foot man. I love to see beautiful feet. And I rarely see beautiful feet, especially when I take a shower. And so the Passover, the Lord's Supper, and the foot washing ceremony has always been extremely humiliating to me. Because when I was a youngster, I used to always just, when I'd go to the beach, I'd dig my toes into the sand because I didn't want anybody to see my feet. Because my mother handed down my brother's shoes, and as I was growing into them, my toes broke and curled under. And so my second toes, which should be slightly longer than my other ones, according to the way my dad was built, are instead bent sideways and look like I could perch <laughs> on a limb. And that's embarrassing. So I have to think. What did Jesus see when he's coming one after another? Here's James and Peter and Andrew. What did Andrew's feet look like? What did John's feet look like? What did Judas Iscariot's feet look like? You know, you just don't know. But he is doing this, and he's wiping them with the towel wherewith he was girded. He come to Simon Peter, and Peter said, Lord, you are trying to wash my feet. It was really, you're not going to wash my feet. Jesus said, what I do you know not now, but you shall know hereafter. And Peter really postured. He said, you'll never wash my feet. This is beneath you. You know, this is humiliating. It was humiliating to Peter, not to Christ. He didn't, just didn't want Christ, his Lord and Master, whom he loved and admired, to stoop to such a thing. And Jesus answered, if I wash you not, 
you have no part with me. You're not one of my guys. You're not one of the group. You're not one of my disciples. You're not going to be in my new kingdom. Simon Peter said, Lord, you know, in that case, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. And Jesus revealed something then. He said, He that is washed, and the original word can mean bathed, need not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And you are clean, but not all. It seemingly is true that he never failed to see that there was like a double entendre, that there was a spiritual lesson in some of the things that he said. And so he implied here Judas Iscariot. You are clean physically, and you're clean spiritually except one of you. You're not all clean spiritually. That was what Jesus Christ was conveying to them. So he stooped to the lowliest kind of work, that of a task servant, and it was the work of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and he just entered into it with absolute alacrity. Now let me tell you about the Christian dilemma that crops up in the church among brethren who throughout much of the year are in anything but a foot washing attitude. You cannot be washing the feet of someone you hate and be really comfortable. You're not going to stoop down and take a gnarled old foot that probably is ugly to start with and lovingly lave it with lukewarm water and wash between the toes and wash the heel and wash underneath it and then rinse it off and then dry it with your own, with a towel maybe on your knee or in your own lap and then put the thing back into a shoe as somebody that you're having problems with, somebody you don't like, somebody that really you spent the whole year thinking, who is this guy? I don't know about him. Well, this is the Christian dilemma a little bit. When you are called of God and you come out of the world, you begin to look around and sometimes people come to it one doctrine at a time and they find out there's a lot of paganism around them. They find out about the Sabbath. Well, that means they also found out about Sunday and they found out about where it came in and how the apostate church began to enforce it upon people. By 325 A.D. it was a done deal and they would said Christians shall no longer Judaize by observing the first day of the, the uh, seventh day of the week, the Sabbath. They find out about the holy days. And then they begin finding out about things like clean and unclean meats. And they find out that the restaurants and the food processors just love to put lard and pork in practically everything that they dispense. They find out the beans and the green beans and the lima beans and the cafeteria got hog fat in them. Little by little they discover all this paganism. The Christmas tree with the orbs, what does that mean? The steeple projecting impudently from the top of a building, where did that come from? What does that mean? What is the symbol of Cleopatra's needle in the Washington Monument, the father of the country? They find out all these things. And so then they look around and they feel betrayed. They begin to become alienated from the world that they have been part and parcel of all of their lives. And the world all of a sudden is very strange to them. They come into the church of God. They are baptized. They have hands laid on for the receiving of God's Holy Spirit. And they begin to try to impose upon themselves a standard of behavior. And that standard out of the Sermon on the Mount is perfection. Love even your enemies. Talking about perfection in every aspect, every walk of life. <laughs> from diet and exercise to your choice of clothing to whether you're ostentatious, to whether you are loud and noisy, to whether you're a gossip or a troublemaker, a well-intentioned dragon, whether you're a really loving, wonderful, warm, companionable person, whether you are a growing, praying person, or whether you're a, a brusque, a uh, very uh, kind of a oddball personality that goes around stepping on toes and hurting people's feelings. And we begin to look around and because we feel betrayed by the world, we've come out of the world, we're now trying to live according to a Christian standard, then we take that standard and we apply that standard to everybody else around us. And we see that these other people are falling short of that standard. When I first went up to the first Feast of Tabernacles after I was out of the Navy, up to Siegler Springs, there was one lady there who was like that. She was hypercritical. She was extremely judgmental. She looked down her pert little nose at everything and everybody. She went around with a spyglass judging the behavior of everybody. Well, I still was smoking. I had my tattoos plainly visible if I wore a short sleeve shirt. And I was up there just barely out of the Navy and barely in Ambassador College. Didn't pretend to be converted. I was just Herbert Armstrong's boy. And she didn't like me and didn't like what I did, and I don't blame her. 
because looking back, I didn't like myself, I don't like what I was then either, but I'm just illustrating the point. I wasn't in the church, but she was extremely judgmental and hypercritical. She didn't come to me warmly and try to talk to me. She didn't, you know, take me in as a sort of a son and, and say, you know, son, these, these are the things you ought to be doing. You shouldn't be smoking. You shouldn't be around here displaying your tattoos before people or whatever it was that bugged her and bothered her. And so time and again, as I was growing up in the church up in Oregon, I found that there were people like that. And I used to bring my poor dear mother to tears in arguing with her against the truth, against the church. Who does my old man think he is? How does he say that he is the only one who, who is right? How can all these other preachers be wrong? How can all the world be wrong but Herbert W. Armstrong? Everybody's out of step but him. That's my dad I'm talking about. Ridiculous. I said, why me, Lord? Come on, why can't it be Dom Jeske? I mean, his dad is a Lutheran. Uh, let it be somebody else, not me. I want to be one in the swim. I want to be one of everybody out here, but I don't want to have to go around dealing with the idea that my dad says he is a minister preaching the gospel for the first time in 1900 years. And so I argued with my mother. You know what my big weapon was? It was the great big stick that little lady and others of her ilk handed me to beat my mother over the head with. Let me say that again. It was the weapon that a very busybody, hypercritical, judgmental, acidic tempered little lady who was way out of line according to the Bible in which she herself believed and professed because she set such a bad example to other people. Satan the devil, and I was of this world, and I don't want to say Satan, that scares me, but I was certainly not of God at that time, can spot the flaws in Christian character quicker than a Christian can. They spot it immediately. And so when we act that way, what we do is hand the enemy a stick to beat us over the head with. And I would use that as an excuse. Well, can't tell me she's a Christian. If she were a Christian, she wouldn't be acting that way. Well, what I said was true. But I hadn't yet come to the point where I understood that two wrongs don't make a right, and that poison added to poison doesn't equal no poison, and that no matter what someone else did, it didn't justify me to do the same thing or even worse, that it was an individual thing. Habakkuk 2 and verse 4, you don't need to turn to that. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Ah, you think that it means the just shall live by faith. That is that he has faith in God, he believes in Christ. But you know what it really implies there? You live according to your own faith. How faithful are you? How knowledgeable? How trusting? How much do you really believe God? And that belief is deeply personal. The just shall live by his faith, not by the faith of the person sitting next to you. Paul said, What knowest thou, O wife, whether you can save your husband? But by your own faith, completely individual. How often have I emphasized that theme? The just shall live by his faith. Habakkuk 2.4. Proverbs 9.12, an interesting one. If you be wise, you shall be wise for yourself. But if you scorn, you alone shall bear it. Forget the lateral associations. We are not marching into the kingdom of God en masse. We're going to achieve the kingdom of God individually, personally, between ourselves and Jesus Christ. The church cannot save you. The church cannot heal you. The church cannot guarantee you entry into God's kingdom. Association or affiliation with the church does not get you anything. You will stand on your own at the time of the final judgment and Jesus Christ separating sheep from goats. Galatians 6, 4, and 5, and I might come back to this a little later. But let every man prove his own work. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. That means to try and test the kind of a character you are. It means how you handle the rough spots in life, how you proceed when troubles come up. How do you handle it? Do you handle it with love, joy, and peace? Do you handle it with goodness, meekness, gentleness, faith? Do you handle it with great patience? Do you handle it with mercy, with understanding? Or do you handle it like we human beings almost always do and that is to react carnally and to kind of give as good as you get. 
I think that process of conversion has its pitfalls because when we come out of the world, we then begin to feel betrayed by the world. We say everything around us is pagan. I remember that I was still smoking then and my sister Dottie smoked for many, many years and uh, bless her heart, she finally reformed and became a non-smoker quite a few years ago now and no one is more intolerant of smokers than reformed non-smokers. To this day, my sister, when we will check into a restaurant, she will say, no smoking. And I mean, it isn't that, could we please have a no smoking seat? Uh, it is no smoking. You know, it's kind of, if you know what's good for you. And uh, I mean, uh, we walk in and I just kind of want to go over and look at a candy machine and wait till Dottie does the no smoking bit so we can go on in. I'm just kidding. but No, I'm not kidding either. It, 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 it happens. Because we become, I think when we come into the church, we become like these reformed smokers. We're not supposed to be committing sin all the time. I know a lot of us do, and I certainly have. I had to repent bitterly and deeply many a time in my life. But when you see other people acting up and sinning, you tend to judge. You tend to, to criticize, and we're not supposed to do that. We tend to get outraged. We tend to get bitter because they're falling short of this new standard that we have placed up there for ourselves. There are all kinds of different personalities in the church of God. Let me give you some of the expressions we use, but set it up by going to Matthew 5, 21 and 2. Jesus said, You've heard that it was said of them by old time, Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill, actually the original is, Thou shalt do no murder, because the Hebrew word is rotsak. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother, and they claim that the without a cause found its way into the text and is not necessarily in the accepted originals, whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Racha, now that's an old word that I'm not familiar with, neither you except in the Bible, and it meant you worthless wretch, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, apparently that really meant a lot more than we think it means today, shall be in danger of hell fire, Gehenna fire. You know what that attitude is? Jesus said it is not that which was, goes in in your food and is cast out in the drought, but it's, that drought, but it's that which comes out of the heart of a man that defiles a man, isn't it? So it's what comes out of the heart. And what he's saying here is somebody is saying, You worthless wretch, you may as well just drop dead. I can't stand you. I don't care anything for you. I mean, if I just saw you lying there bleeding, I wouldn't even stop. And he says, you have as good as killed him. Now, here are some of the expressions we use, and I've just thought of a few of them I'll give you, in which we put people down. Have you ever noticed that the people who are going a little bit faster and go roaring around you are reckless fools? And that the people who are going way too slow and are impeding traffic are idiots. I mean, we, but only you going along at the exact pace or doing it exactly the way you should be doing it. Here are some of the expressions that we use. Fool, wretch, loony, looney tunes, slob, heel, pig, jerk, idiot, jackass, dork, geek, dweeb, dunce, twit, snark, snurf, nerd, fruitcake, dunderhead, ding-a-ling, addlehead, scatterbrain, schmuck, dizzy, one brick shy of a load, one oar in the water, twisted off, pinhead, lame brain, lunatic, stupid, <laughs> oaf, sorry, kind of funny, boob, babbler, bonehead, lush, booze hound, boozer, wino, guzzler, ferret face, leech, lantern jaw, lowbrow, and those are only the clean ones. <laughs> if you were to put a lot of other words with that, it would just they're commonplace, and all the time you see that and hear it. Now, here are some of the ethnic slurs, and I'm not going to use the N-word. I don't even want to say that in jest, so I'm going to leave that completely out. Slope, slant, greaser, pepper belly, wop, Polak, mick, greaseball, pachuco, checko, oaky, arky, hillbilly, redneck, chink, jap, gook, kraut, frog, jungle bunny, night fighter, hiney, fritz, yank, reb, blue belly, bohunky, honky, swine, dog face, limey, raghead, camel jockey, schweinhund, pig face, and in Australia, a limp-wristed poofta. <laughs> and then there are the unprintable ones, and they outnumber the ones that I just listed. There are a lot of unprintable ones. We'd be here all afternoon talking. Now, th these and in other ways is the way we express our fear, our hatred, our contempt. 
if they dress differently, if they look differently, talk differently, and, and do things differently than we do. Now, what would it take to have you hold in your hand the Lord's Supper, the foot of a dweeb, or the foot of a dark, or the foot of a jerk? You see what I'm saying? You don't think that at that time because everybody gets very somber and very sober and very loving toward each other. But my point is that we ought to be that way every single day of every year. And that these are not dorks, twits, dweebs, slopes, and jerks, but brothers and sisters and part of a loving family instead. Look at Galatians 5, 13 through 23, a very beautiful passage. Brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. You've been called to no account against your ledger in heaven above. You've been completely forgiven of sin. You've got nothing hanging over your head. So don't use that as an occasion to get back into carnality and into judging one another. I'm not even going to go to Matthew 7, judge not that you be not judged. We all know that. But we tend to do it. And it really means condemn not that you be not condemned because Paul said, I have judged already. You're constantly judging. And that merely means comparison. But this is in the sense of condemning and criticizing and accusing. Once you see, you can see very plainly when someone is acting in a, in a completely unchristian, unscriptural way. And you're not being judgmental by seeing that and understanding that that is happening. I've seen the one with the, uh, the Australian version at the Outback, which shows an emu. And they do the, the monkey deal, you know, see no evil, hear no evil, say no evil, with the mouth and the eyes and the ears plugged. And they have a picture, but it's got this stupid emu there. And it's a weird looking thing. And it's kind of a portrayal of that same attitude you've heard the Protestants say for many years. See no evil, hear no evil speak no evil. Many people carry that to such an extreme that if they were seeing the most gross and absolute unchristian act right in front of them, they would say, oh, but I must not judge. Well, of course you should. Of course you discern, you see, you apprehend, you understand that this person is way out of line, but you don't condemn. You say, under certain inputs, I might respond that way myself. You don't condemn. You don't say, therefore, you know, a way to get in a fire with them. You just understand, oh, they're acting like a child or whatever. Of course we judge. Judging means to discern. And criticize and condemn is the part that Christ himself said that he condemned, that we should not be condemning one another. He says, for all the laws fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Many years ago, there was an interesting little book written by Philip Wiley. He was an American philosopher, the acidic pen, the deft turn of a phrase like an epé in a fencing duel, and he was able to really put people down. There were chapters in one of his books about doctors, another one about the common man, about husbands, and about the Maggie and Jig syndrome, about husbands that were browbeaten couch potatoes and so on and didn't live up to what they should. But this was a, an interesting little novel. And the novel portrayed how in the explosion of a nuclear device at Bikini Atoll, after it was all over and the ships were able to go in there, someone came across a being lying there glowing with a translucence. And it was obviously either dead or unconscious. And they picked it up and they got all excited about it because it was like no creature anyone had seen. It looked like a man. But it was glowing with a translucence. It was like white and, and all these wonderful translucent colors. And it was obviously inert. And so in great secrecy, they loaded this creature aboard a ship and took it back to Australia. They contacted the White House and they didn't know what to do. The CIA sent agents, the FBI sent agents, the military and naval intelligence were there to try to investigate it. And they were all gonna rush down to Australia to get there to try to find out what is this creature anyway? And in the meantime, when the information got to Washington, D.C., they began to discuss it, and they called some of the world's leading theologians, and they wanted to ask them all about it. Well, in the meeting that ensued between the theologians, it finally got into fisticuffs in the book. They, they totally disagreed. They were shouting at one another, absolutely not, you're wrong, it can't be an angel, because atomic and hydrogen bombs cannot affect an angel. Well, what is it then? It isn't human. It can't be an alien from outer space because we don't accept that. And on and on and on. They got a big, huge argument. 
Well, at about the same time, the Russians had exploded an atomic bomb way out in the hinterland of the Ukraine or way out somewhere in uh, Slavovia and discovered a like phenomenon. There was another one of these creatures. They knew nothing about the discovery of the one the United States had discovered and taken to Australia. But now they had to put this thing aboard a train and get it back to the Kremlin because they wanted uh, at this time Khrushchev to see it. And on the way, they were doing the same thing. All their experts and all the KGB were trying to figure it out. And as the novel developed, just before all these people could descend upon Australia to look at the carcass that they had kept in safekeeping there, heavily guarded, and just before the train could pull into Moscow station on this heavily guarded train in this locked compartment, both of them disappeared. And there wasn't a creature there anymore. And they got to searching around and they looked and looked and there was some strange language. They couldn't decipher it. So the cryptographers and everybody began to try to break the code. And finally they did it with just a simple little two-word statement. Love one another. And that little book packed a tremendous wallop because it went through all of the nuclear testing of the two great powers in the Cold War, the saber rattling, that were going to mutually annihilate one another, and that the explosions of man had mounted up so far it actually knocked an archangel out of the sky, and they just left a message. Why don't you people love one another? It, it packed a powerful wallop. It was quite a little book, and I'm glad that I read it. So, he says, all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. For this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other. That's exactly what Paul said in his seventh chapter of Romans, O wretched man that I am, that which I want to do I find myself not doing, and that which I don't want to do I find myself doing, who shall deliver me from this body of death? He said, you cannot do the things you would. You know, to this day, I have never seen Matthew 18 followed meticulously, religiously, spiritually, perfectly. I've seen people give lip service to it, I've seen people who say they have followed Matthew 18. I've seen people try to follow Matthew 18. But what I've seen instead is oftentimes when people feel they've got their feelings hurt. Yeah, you hurt my feelings. Oh, you hurt my widow feelings. And so they don't go to the person that hurt their feelings. That's the last person they would go to. First they talk to their wife or their husband. Then they talk to their closest friend. Then they talk to another couple of friends. And then somebody else chimes in and says, well, yeah, I see what you're saying. He hurt my feelings in the same way. Or I didn't like that sermon either. Or I don't like the way he has this or the other kind of a style of the way he does things either. So finally they decide we're going to follow Matthew 18. And we're going to go to this guy en masse. And we're going to sit there and go through all these problems. Now, I've seen that happen not just once, but many, many times in the past. But what I'm saying is that there are always there's always plenty of blame to go around. In any human situation, there's blame for me, there's blame for you, there's blame for everybody. Let me give you a little secret here, a little inside information. My wife can corroborate and so can my son. I'd say up to four or five times a year, I stand here or somewhere in a pulpit, and I deliver a sermon. And sometimes I think the sermons are okay. Sometimes I think they're pretty good. And sometimes I think they're just sort of a journeyman job and, and just sort of uh, par for the course. But on a few occasions per year, we'll be on the way home and my wife will say, honey, you just can't let that go out. And on a rare occasion, I'll even be surprised. Well, why? Why not? Well, you said this and you said that. And you named a name or you got back you know, talking about old this and that or way back in the past or whatever. And I will react, well, I don't know, it's got to go out, no way. And I'll react defensively. And I'll say, no, I don't, I don't agree with you. Well, say, well, Mark was upset too. Well, he was, huh? <laughs> yeah. Mark, Mark told me, oh, Mom, don't let that go out. I get to thinking about it. And Mom, uh, Cheryl and Mark, I call her Mom all the time, uh, can tell you that it might take me a few hours, on a rare occasion it even took until the next day, 
but I'll just call and say, don't let that one go out. That ain't any good. Just cancel that one. Now, I don't claim to stand up here and preach out of total inspiration all the time. Maybe portions of what I say, as long as I've got my nose in this Bible, you can say are inspired because they were inspired in the first place. When I go to extemporizing and uh, giving you my ideas, I've suddenly stepped out of the inspirational aspect and I'm just giving you my ideas. And I think it's a melange or a sort of a mixture of both sometimes. I hope that sometimes there are sermons that are close to inspired, but I don't claim to do that very often. I preached, I guess, tens of thousands of sermons and broadcasts, and I don't think I've ever done a perfect one yet, and I doubt if I ever will. There was a lady who came one time, and I, I thought a great deal of the lady, and I had known her and her family for a long time. She attended maybe twice, and I gave one of my poorer sermons. She never came back, and I have felt very bad about that. I thought, now why did you have to give that sermon at that time? And the lady didn't come to me and talk about it, and if she had, it would have been so nice. And so that's what I'm saying. Don't build any barriers. I will not try to construct barriers. I will never try to intimidate anybody. Don't intimidate. Don't build barriers. Don't try to be the big minister up there to where people are afraid to come to you with a problem that they perceive. And if your critic perceives the problem, he or she really thinks it's that way. I don't think people lie awake at night saying, now how can I dream up a problem to get this guy? I think something bothers them, and then I think a little natural metamorphosis takes place. And it goes something like this. A guy is sitting there in his living room, and his grass is real long, and he's sitting there and thinking, oh no, that dumb mower broke down. He's thinking, well, old George next door has got a nice mower. I'll go over and ask George if I can borrow his mower. And I don't know, old George, he's sort of cantankerous, and I, I, he hadn't been too friendly lately, and maybe he'll tell me, no, I can't borrow his mower. Well, nuts to old George. He's kind of a dork anyway. Uh, I'll tell you what, that, that attitude bugs me to death. I, old George sitting there, I'm not going to give him a mower. And uh, so he thinks about it and thinks about it, and so two or three hours later, he goes there and punches the doorbell, and it opens up, and George says, hi, Sam. Wham! He hits him right in the face. What'd you do that for? He says, keep your dumb old mower. <laughs> so he built up this gigantic, big straw man in his mind. He created an attitude in George that George didn't even hold, that George knew nothing about. But the guy was so defensive and so angry by the time he got over there to punch the doorbell that he went ahead and just punched old George out while he was at it. <laughs> and a lot of times I have entered into conversations with people where they will tell me that I think thus and such. And I'll be so astounded, my jaw will almost hit the desk. But what? I never thought of such a thing. You ever been in a deal like that? Have you ever gotten into an argument where people tell you what you think and you didn't think it? We all have. You know we have. Well, it happens. So what we do is we create this ogre. We create this monster. We create this straw man in our own minds. And then when it comes time, push comes to shove, as they say, then we just unload and we hit them with what kind of a monster they really are when in fact we're talking about a straw man. We're tilting at wind, windmills, as it said in Don Quixote. So bear that in mind, because the lessons in life that we need to learn are very, very profound, and they have to do with whether or not we will even be into the kingdom of God. He says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. He covered almost the entire gamut of human misbehavior. Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Remember I've said before in the past, and I talked about the little old lady in that funny little cart, the little uh, commercial years ago where the little lady was there and she picked up a McDonald's or one of the hamburgers and I guess she's advertising McDonald's or one of them and she says, where's the beef? And it was so funny and it probably won an award and sold a lot of hamburgers for the one that advertised it that way. But you always have to ask yourself in any kind of a confrontational situation, where's the love? Look for it. 
Look all over and try to find it. Where's the love? When you find it, you're going to make it okay. You're going to be through the situation just fine. If there is love there, if the love is present, you'll have no problem because love conquers everything. God is love, and this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. Joy. Now, you see, love produces joy. If love is there, you're happy. You're not, when you're in love, when you love someone, you're not down, sure do love you today. No, no way. When you love someone, you're up, you're happy. And so love produces joy. And joy, it says, peace follows. Joy produces peace. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And I've thought of an analogy there. In Tyler, they have these green lights, and a lot of people will sit there and not run a green light. Even though there is no traffic coming, the green arrow is not on, but the green light is on, and they will just sit there. I'm going to wait for that green arrow. Well, there is no law against running a green light. You can go through a green light as long as no traffic is coming. And so it reminds me of this scripture when I see that happening against such there is no law. You're within the law when you're meek. You're within the law when you're temperate. You're within the law when you have love and joy and peace and long-suffering and all of those qualities. James 1, 9 and 10 is an interesting one. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. That's obvious. That's easy. When you are lowly and you've been given a big raise, when you have been given some kind of a promotion, when you've been recognized for your contribution or your service. But the rich, in that he is made low. Wow. Where have you ever seen that happen? The rich saying, well, I've got some lessons to learn. Now I see how the other side lives. The scripture that says, they that were brought up in purple shall embrace dunghills. And it says here, let the rich, when he is made low, when he's lost everything, rejoice. Because we're talking about spiritual and eternal values, and we're not talking about short-lived material values values that are so quickly gone, and he goes right on to talk about the flower of the grass, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. Now, Galatians 6, 1 to 11, right quickly, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, and that happens so often, I've been overtaken in faults many times, so have you, so have we all, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Say, I could be doing the same thing. I could be just like that. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. That doesn't mean don't bear your own burden. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. There are a lot of people like that. I've seen some people that have absolutely nothing to base it upon, but have gigantic ego, and you have too. I certainly saw it in the military. I think some of the greatest ego in the world I've seen in very, you know, lowly, uh, petty officers and enlisted men in the, in the military who thought that they had great power, or even a traffic director out in the street. You see all kinds of illustrations of that in life, and I won't uh, take time to tell you about the ensign and the admiral story, which I've told in the past. If a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then he shall have rejoicing in himself alone. He'll say, hey, that was all right. I did a good job. You know how you feel? You women, how do you feel when you've done a spring house cleaning? How do you feel when you've gone completely through the house, the closets, the kitchen, the bathroom, and the, even the, every, every room is spick and span, white glove inspection, got everything put where it, it's a wonderful feeling, isn't it? You feel so good when you accomplish a good job. I used to feel that way if I'd chop a half a cord of wood. I used to feel that way when I'd finished the lawn and trimmed it and mowed it. And it looks spick and span. I'd done a good job. It looks good. It makes me feel good. Let every man prove his own work, and he has rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Now, that's not a contradiction. You bear your own and you bear the other. Let me give you an analogy. It says on some golf courses, fix your divot and one other beside. When you make a little hole in the green, when your ball lands on it, they call it a divot. And you have a little tool to try to fix that. It takes three seconds to fix it, and it takes six weeks to heal naturally. So it's better to fix it in three seconds. So I make it a habit to try to fix two or three if I can find them there. And that's what this is saying. Fix your own, and also fix everybody else's if you possibly can, if you have time for it. 
Bear your own burden, your own responsibility. You share in the troubles of another. You don't add to them, you share in them, you try to help them. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. As they say, what goes around comes around. And uh, that certainly happens to us in life. He that sows to his flesh of the flesh shall reach corrup uh, reap corruption, but he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. In the pastoral epistles, the Apostle Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, 4 through 7, not to give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying, building up, encouraging, supporting, which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment, the goal, the aim of the commandment is charity, that's that agape love, out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unpretended, unfeigned, from which some, having swerved aside, have turned unto vain jangling, that's what he called chaotic arguments and discussions, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. And in 1 Corinthians 14, 26, there's an additive to that. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you has a psalm. I want you to see the song I wrote, the poem. I get them all the time. That's fine. A lot of people are very gifted, and I appreciate some of them. I really do. I don't want to put people down that send me a psalm. And thankfully, people here don't say, look at the new song I wrote every time we, we come together. But Paul is talking about the fact that those people would have different ideas, idea babies, has a doctrine, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. You give birth to an idea baby. You coddle it. You nurse it. You watch it grow. And it is yours. You have engendered this idea. And people will hit me. When I get an envelope, a big manila envelope, about, you know, a foot and a half, two feet wide, and about, you know, 16, 30 pages thick, I almost moan. I'll say, oh, no, not another one. I've been getting them lately about the date for the Passover and dates when we ought to do things and about the holy days and about the calendar and about all kinds of doctrinal ideas. And I get dozens of them every single year. He says, how is it when you come together? Everybody has one of these things. It's an idea, babe. They cuddle it, they love it, and they can't give it up. The idea of it dying or being aborted is just anathema because it is their idea. They concocted it, they came up with it, and they know that it's got to be real, and it is to them, and they want to see that that is born, full born, and then they want to get recognition in the church, their name on the document. Guess who came up with a new doctrine? I've seen it for decades in my life. Well, all of that is not the foot washing attitude. The foot washing attitude is, I think, one that is an attitude of total humility, of servitude, of abasement, of brotherly love, and there's one scripture I'll leave with you that is one that I like that is at least somewhat comforting to me. Romans 10, 15, 13 through 15. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Well, these old feet have carried me several hundred thousand miles, maybe more than a million or so. And they've walked in Japan and India and Vietnam and Australia and New Zealand and South Africa and Kenya and Khartoum and in places like West Africa in the Cape Verde Islands and the Azores and up in Newfoundland and up in Alaska, and in Iceland, and in Greenland, and in every continent on this earth, and all over South America, every country, every country in Central America, and every state in the United States. And they've jogged up and down basketball courts, and they have carried me through 71 years of my life, and they're very, very ugly to me. But then, when this scripture tells me that those feet that carry people through life and they are used to preach the good news that is saving knowledge of the coming kingdom of God. Doesn't matter how maybe misshapen they are, or how fat they are, how skinny they are, how gnarled or bent or twisted they are, that they are beautiful because they got the man there 
and he got the job done. So if we can just be in a foot washing attitude and we're going to hold a brother or a sister's foot in our hands and we're going to have love and harmony and peace and we're an open arms church and when new people come in they're going to come in and find nothing but the warmest, friendliest, most wonderful environment they could ever imagine. A people who really love them and care for them. Let's just be in a foot washing attitude.